So today, we've got a lot of information that came through that you received today, and it was from the medical experts, the key opinion leaders, the KOLs, who gave you information about your disease. And then Stephanie was really good about bringing you some information about how to deal with a, with a chronic illness and how to cope with it. And there was some really good mechanisms and how to um, work it into your life. I have a friend of mine who was said, I don't make the disease control my life. The disease has to work into my life. And um, I always kind of think about that when, whenever I'm, I'm with people with the, from the rare disease community. And certainly with Lisa's helpful hints, about what to do to advocate for yourself or for a loved one and to speak up for yourself and build that, that communication with your healthcare provider, your healthcare physician is really important. And it kind of brings us all together. You form a community. You form a community within your own healthcare um, world. It's your healthcare providers, it's supplemental, uh, whether it's a social worker, maybe it's your yoga instructor, you know, but and then you're also armed with some information that you've been collecting about your disease, but you've been building your community and your support system. And that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit, is to finding support within your community. So you say, all right, so what constitutes this community? What is this community? Well, it could be anything it usually in the core of your community is your family. And so I kind of thought about all the different aspects that make up my community. And you know, from elementary school through college, and from all my work experiences, and my social, where I go for social kind of things. And a faith community comes a part of my, my life. And whatever I'm interested in, I, I will admit I do ballroom dancing, so I'm interested in ballroom dancing, so that's part of my crazy community. And my neighborhood, where I live, whether I live where I grew up in Brooklyn and where I now live in Connecticut, all, all has been part of my community. So then I decided, well, let me look what my community looks like. Well, this is pretty <laughs> scary, isn't it? So, you know, once again, whoop, let's go back here. So once again, I am, I am here in the middle with the family. And it's size, yeah, maybe this is pretty, big because there's a, I rely on this community a lot. And it's not the breakfast club from the movie, but it's my friends from the breakfast club, all right? And, but it's all these lines are how they are interconnected. And it's, you know, my from my volunteer to the people that I've met in the rare disease community, to people that I met from patient advocacy groups who have become, you know, they, I met them here, but then they also became family or they became friends. And people I work with, how we all connect. It, a lot of my PTA, if I travel a line here, my PTA is gonna land up at this breakfast club because those are the people I met through the PTA and they became a close group of friends who we look out for one another. So if you ever sat down and said, who would make up my community? You could have something just as crazy as this. But in all reality, the, the community types, so what is, if we look about patient community, is that in most cases there is offline so you have your family your friends you have people you know from schools from your church uh, people you work with in past jobs and current jobs maybe it's a hobby um, maybe it's where you volunteer people have offline communities in your civic in your community if you're active in your local politics or you have health related support group communities is another group that you could belong and so Offline used to be um, the way to go. When I first started in the rare disease community, there was no internet. And the networking programs that we used to run were really letters or phone calls. And that was how we used to connect people and that's how it all started. But now we have the online. And so while there are similar, some of these are similar to online communities, you have your, your school, your my grammar school has a website and they keep bombarding you with, you know, come and let's reconnect and we do. But, you know, maybe you're, I know of um, career related, I know of people who used to work at companies that have reunions. It's kind of, I find that kind of interesting. 
but they do. But online communities can be similar. They could be specialist interests. They're also, LinkedIn is a, a job-related community. A lot of people are linked in with each other. There are games. Heaven knows, I, I do play Words with Friends, but um, you know there are people who have a little bit more interest with games, and shopping, and there's recreational, and there's health. And then the social media online can be subcategorized subcategorized into chat groups or Facebook, Twitter, and even Pinterest is, is a way of building some type of a community. And so you could say, well, is there a value? Is there a value to establishing or affiliating with a community? Yes, there is. So you could probably list things, but you know, you get a camaraderie and and support in good times and in bad. And it gives you, maybe it gives you a social life or it's a nesting place. It's a place that you know you can just hang out. Like Norm in Cheers, you know, he would walk in and everybody say, hi Norm. He always felt happy in the bar in Cheers. And you know, so it was like his nesting place. He kind of like hung out there. But it gives you good conversations and it, maybe it gives you new adventures. And it can be entertaining. I know my breakfast club is very entertaining at times. And, um, and even ballroom dancing is very entertaining. And sometimes it's a sanctuary. Sometimes it's just your community, and maybe it's a faith base, or maybe it's just a group of people that you can just go and hang and feel comfortable with. And it is a place to go when you're feeling kind of down, or maybe it's a place to go where you want to um, celebrate. And there's some fond memories that you have with a community. If you're, to re go back to your old neighborhood and you see some old neighbors and friends and you sort of sit and you reminisce. And, and with a community, there's always opportunities to grow. Each of the communities you belong to give you that chance to be a better person or to expand your, your horizon. Excuse me? Well, yes, we, but we are not gonna get there today. <laughs> That's an outside the hall conversation. So are there, are there hurdles? Are there community hurdles? Yes, there are. There are, there are. So sometimes your community could be short-lived. Maybe you're only with a group for a short amount of time. There's only a need to be with that community for a short amount of time. Sometimes communities come and go. Maybe they are, again, they're there for the moment or you, you rally together to do some sort of cause, especially on a civic level, or maybe in a church level, or, um, or even in a neighborhood. Your neighborhood all gets together and you rally for a cause. I used to do that when they were gonna put crazy zoning into my neighborhood and the neighbors would all get together, we'd go to City Hall, and, and then when it was over, it was over. That was it. And sometimes life will throw you a wild card. Maybe it's a diagnosis, maybe it's a death, maybe it's a divorce, a sickness, a loss of job. So, and so maybe you leave or you come in and out of that community. And so maybe there's a difference of opinions really intensify. And this happens a lot in communities where you sort of begin to share how you think and what you want to do. And then you, people begin to say, well, I don't agree with you. And that's okay. But you know, let's continue the conversation. But sometimes it gets too intense and people just raise their hands in the air and they leave. Or maybe it's in the same vein. It's not accepting the adage to agree to disagree. That is really hard to do. But if you really believe in the community, then it's worth the effort to accept that and to do it. Sometimes communities can be one-sided or single-focused. You know. Sometimes they lose their vitality, they lose their vision, they lose their value for you, for somebody else, or for other people. So a community, it's always challenging to keep that vision going, to keep the vitality going. It, maybe it's no longer relevant. Again, maybe it was only a short-lived. Maybe it's no longer relevant to you or to others. There's limited time, you have limited access, you, or you have no time to give. It's getting, overwhelming or you say, you know, I have to put that on the back burner for a while. It goes into what Stephanie was talking about. It's that stresses that have to deal with. You're a PTA mom and you have a lot going on and you have a child with a chronic illness and you say, you know what? I have to back off. And I'm gonna back off for a little while and that's okay. 
it's becoming exclusive. You know, is it, is it not open to other opinions? Is it not open to bringing people in? I kid about my breakfast crew friends, and we all started as moms of kids in the same parochial school that our kids went to when we were fundraising and doing all that crazy stuff. But as the years went by, there were other people that we got to meet and we wanted, them to, we wanted to hang out with them. And so they would just come to the breakfast crew and we would have breakfast every Saturday morning for the past 20 years. We have no life. Um, and maybe the solutions to maybe fix a community for any one of those reasons is too much time. It's taking too much time and energy and you just say, I, it's toxic. I have to move away from it. So when it comes to the patient community, are there reasons to connect to a patient community? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because there's comfort in knowing that there's a place to go. This Norm from Cheers, it was comforting for him to go there. But if for a patient community, it is good. And maybe you just want to sit on the sidelines, but that's OK. It provides hope. That's fine. You learn about other people's experiences. And then maybe you can relate to some of those. You discover resources that could be helpful. Maybe there is something that your doctor didn't know about, but somebody in your patient community did. And you say, hmm, that works. You know, I could do that. You can decide to participate or just observe. This is like one of my favorite things to do, is that you are in charge of what you can do. You know your limitations and you know what you can and can't do. So you can be an active participant in the, your patient community. You can be a quasi-active, or you can stand on the sidelines and just sort of take it in, and then use it when you want to. Many years ago, I worked um, in, in my former job. I had worked with a patient community that was still pre-internet, and it was all caregivers and patients affected by a very rare disease. And um, I got a letter one day from a woman who said, my husband is now deceased from this. And even though I wasn't really active, I really have come to love this community, but I need to step back because it's, it's hurtful for me, it's painful for me to be in this community. Could you tell them, please? And so I very happily gave that message to the rest of the community. And they were gr gracious, and she was, but, she knew when to step back, but she didn't want to hurt anybody else's feelings, and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, you, let me just, who, where am I? Um, where am I? It is, nowadays you get to move beyond geographic borders, and you're not just limited to the state of California. You can, you can, go to Canada. You can access people in Canada. And um, the other thing is that the information is accessible. Maybe their information is accessible in understandable terminology. A lot of times you were talking about just before about having articles about your disease. And sometimes it's in medical jargon and it don't always understand. And maybe the, your community could help translate that for you. And even caregivers can get in on this, and other family members can connect with each other as well. There's a growing swell of that to bring in the caregiver, whether it's a spouse, a parent, a sibling, a child, is an older child, is, is to bring that in. It helps you to be better informed so that you can make your own health decisions. Connecting with a patient community gives you that chance to take in the information, you kind of, figure out how you want it to do, and then you use what you can use when you're talking to take care of yourself or a loved one. And then there's various methods on how you can connect to a patient community. There's email, there's a listserv, there's listservs, just groups that get together and they go back and forth with comments. There's webinars, places have webinars. Facebook is a, is a wonderful place for these. So, Online, uh, online communities, and there are support groups all over the place. Is it important to evaluate them? Yes, yes. Just like you, know, you evaluate your doctors or you read consumer reports to evaluate the camera or the car or whatever you're gonna buy, yes, you need to evaluate 
your, the patient community that you're going to associate with? Is it because you want to ensure its integrity and that it's on the up and up, and you want to make sure that it's not a fly by night, that it's not here today and gone tomorrow. You want to make sure that it's sticking around to take care of the community that it has said that it's interested in. That there are appropriate disclaimers at this community that they're not imparting, imparting medical information. If they're not doctors, they shouldn't be giving diagnostic information or imparting what could be considered medical information. So they should have appropriate disclaimers on there as well. And it's moderated. In most cases, these, these online uh, patient communities need to be moderated so that there, there's someone keeping the peace, someone corralling the cats, someone just making sure everybody's playing nice in the sandbox. Um, years ago, I was, there was a very rare cancer group and they were on what was considered, uh, uh, it was almost pre-Yahoo groups. It was very, was really, <laughs> I'm dating myself here, so it was really was a long time ago. And they all got, it was, they need, this was a place, this was their place to go to, and a lot of comments would come in, and it was all started out very scientific, which was fine. And then all of a sudden, people started wishing each other happy birthday or have a good day. And then, well, all right, that was okay, a little, you know, didn't get too crazy. And then there were, oh, here's a little more religious views, and people began to take offense to it. And then, then it was political views, and then it was all these crazy things coming in, and it was not what the guy who started it intended it to be. So he landed up making two sites. And he said, here is one to make it personal, and you can send all the happy birthday wishes you want. And here is one that is more scientific. And at the time, it was, and the community was like, all right, we can live with that. It was great. You know, but he moderated it to make sure that it was respectful and that it was appropriate. Okay? And that's what you want to make sure, too, that it's respectful. You may not always have to agree, you agree to disagree. And it allows for the give and take of information. When you're on these types of, of, of patient communities, you want to make sure there's a give and take of information that you can share the back and forth. And that the contact, this is, ooh, this, I want to get, this is really important. Contact information for administrators is readily available. You want to be able to know who's behind this site. Who, maybe there's a couple of people and that you can contact them if you have a concern. That is really, really important. And that goes for any websites, is that you know who is working it and they have their information, their phone number, an email address, some way for you to get a hold of it. And that generally that you have a good vibe about the environment and that you feel that it's safe and welcoming. You have to trust your instincts, and it has to feel safe. So that what kind of patient communities are there? Well, there are the established 501c3s. So if I take Global Genes for an example, they're an established 501c3. They're, but they're, not, they're an umbrella organization. So, but there are some disease-specific. There's a Lupus Foundation. There's a Gillian barre Foundation. There's several organizations that are disease-specific. But if there isn't one for your disease, your particular disease, there are umbrella organizations like Global Genes and Genetic Alliance and Eurotis and Nord and CORD, Canadian Organization for Rare Diseases. Nord is the National Organization for Rare Disorders. They're incorporated. They had rules to follow. They have to get IRS designation. They're put together. They have a mission. They have a vision. They have a board. They have a medical advisors. They have bylaws. It's very structured. It's usually all volunteer or it's a paid staff or maybe it's a, a little bit of both. They rely on the kindness of others for their money, donations, maybe grants. Um, it's kitchen table to fully mature organizations. A lot of rare disease groups are kitchen table, sometimes snack table I call them because they're really that small. And, and they, some of them grow up to be very full matured organizations. And you know, there's a little bit more than 2,500 rare disease support groups out there. 7,000 rare diseases, you know, and there's some duplicity in those 2,500. So I, there's several diseases I know that have two or three or more support groups for them. So in trying to find out how I could say what the opposite of, of, of this was, I came up with the organic patient communities. 
So they're created in response to a health need or an event. People start these communities just kind of to talk about it. It provides hope and it fills a void. And you, you want to connect with others in a non-cumbersome way. This stuff may be too cumbersome and it takes a while and it takes some upfront money to do this. But an organic patient community, is, which is just a gathering together of people, is non-cumbersome and it's easier. It's easier to do. It uses social media as a primary home. It can be used, this meetup format can also be a way to do it organically. What starts maybe is something on social media, and if there's a group of people who find out that they all live in, you know, Burlington, you know, California, they'll meet at Starbucks or someplace and, and get together and meet. And that's kind of like this meetup format, which was actually created for the single scene many years ago, but um, I digress. It's more casual and inviting, uh, uh, the organic. It's very casual. Again, it's not all this. Not that this isn't bad. This is really good stuff. But sometimes you need this before any of that happens. It feels friendly. There's a common bond. You have a common bond with these people. And, and you want to strengthen that over time. And sometimes you do see it. We have seen these organic groups some have become a 501c3. Some are still very fine with being how they are. And that's where it is. You can decide to remain organic or you can move to the next level. So organic patient communities, so what value do they have? There's a natural feel to them. There's a, it comes organically. Um, it provides a safe haven and that home. You, you heavily rely on each other's experiences whether it's life, whether it's through their doctors, whether it's through anything. It's vital and a needed support system. Sometimes it's the first and only place where some people can go to get information now about their disease. And so through these organic patient communities, you can find resources such as healthcare professionals or dietary hints or IEPs. I, I come from a family of educators, so I'm into those kind of things. And um, life hints in general, sometimes there's some helpful hints that people learn from them. It can influence change. Um, it can, if they have a strong enough voice and they're becoming known to the medical or research community, they are being watched and they're being looked at. And maybe they can help because you, people are very honest on these, on these websites, on these social media pages. It raises awareness on a particular disease through the personal interactions. And it is the power of the patient's story that helps to raise awareness of that disease. It helps to, um, it, it can be very helpful for the individual to share that story, but it also is helpful for healthcare professionals to understand what you're going through or for insurance companies to understand, or even media to get the awareness out, the, the power of the patient story. It, it can, like again, foster these local meetups, moving that, that online community into something being more interpersonal. Um, you can feel that one's opinions and experience are valued and respected, that what you have to say, people are listening, and that no one thinks you're crazy because you have this common bond. And that you, you feel that there's new topics to be discussed. Maybe somebody stumbled upon something or I have a question about their doctor said, and this may be a sounding board for you. You can move in and out. You can go in, you can go out. No one's going to hold it against you. There's no ties unless you want to make that tie. And you can celebrate with or comfort each other. I've seen some wonderful things happen through these organic where they become very much like family. And you, you know that you can rely on them in times of need, any time, any hour, and there's no judgment. So where do they find these communities? Well, uh, you can find them, I, I kind of put them in two different buckets. So there are some organic patient communities that just, um, the Yahoo groups, which is still around, they, they, you can go on to the, you know, that link and they can, 
I threw in Yahoo Groups Health because I knew that there were, I've seen and still uh, follow some Yahoo Groups. Uh, Facebook, certainly. You can search under the disease of interest. You, um, it, it's probably the most popular home site for these types of organic patient communities. And with Facebook, they either offer an open option where anybody can comment on it, or they have closed where you have to access for membership. Or just you talk to an administrator, I think. I'm fascinated with Pinterest, and there's a reason that I'm fascinated with Pinterest, is that my daughter is a first grade teacher and she always goes to it for her bulletin boards. And I did take a course in social media that was done by the Mayo Clinic and found out that one of the cardiologists who ran the social media course, he was like, well, I have a Pinterest page. And I'm like, you're a cardiologist. What do you have a Pinterest page for? And it wasn't just his recipes or his new bow tie, because the guy wore bow ties a lot, but he would have cardiac exercises on there and special meals and all this other crazy, all these other things that pertain to his, his profession and his practice. And so I went to look on Pinterest, and there is a growing list of medical-related sites, including rare diseases that are popping up. And parents are talking about raising a child with a rare disease. There was uh, newborn screening. I mean, there was a lot of different things. So I, I, I no longer uh, think that that's just for the education or you're planning a wedding, people. Centers of Excellence and Hospitals Research Institutions may offer in-person meetings or the local physicians may have meetings or sometimes they may have, uh, social workers may bring together patients to that. I was, um, I live in Connecticut and I was once asked to come and speak at, up at Hartford for a group of MS patients who were meeting in a local hospital and they wanted to talk about a, a certain topic and I was invited to be there. And it was a loose group. They didn't, they just were MS patients and the social worker felt it was really important for them to get together. And that's why the social service agencies sometimes have some of these very casual support groups, right Stephanie? And that may offer some in-person meetings or think that it's important for it to bring some people together. There are organized patient communities and these sometimes they are through disease specific uh, support groups have them and they have online chats or um, they have their own list. Gen Genetic Alliance I know has a listserv, right? They have their own and you can be, is it just for groups or is it? It's for patient advocacy organizations, they have it. Um, then there are some of the umbrella groups have some sort of or may be able to direct you to uh, an organized chat area or an organized patient community. And so, you, can, you know, whether it's Global Genes or it's Genetic Alliance or RareDiseases.org is for NORD. Um, there's through the National Institutes of Health, there is the Genetic and Rare Disease section. It's run by the, uh, the National Institutes of Health Office of Rare Disease Research. And they have a lot of lists of places to go to. There are other kind of groups called Inspire. It has, it, this is one, probably one of the longest and the oldest. They, they came after Yahoo. They have communities. You don't have to be part of a group. You can just go on there and see if there is something about your disease and join up as a, as a member. Patients Like Me is another one. Ben's Friends and MD Junction are all places that have these types of communities and they may have one for your particular disease. You can put it in to find out. Or um, they already have communities on there that you can join as a patient. And again, you can be as active or inactive as you want. Sometimes there's comfort in knowing that there is out there. So in conclusion, you know, how do you make the most of your patient community? It's what you want to put into it, what you want to take out of it. And so, and you don't always have to agree, which is why I like the quote that, I know there is strength in the differences between us, but I know there is comfort where we overlap. And it doesn't mean that we all have to be on the same page. That sometimes it is our differences that make the best part of bringing us together, and um, which I always find fun. And I decided I needed to give myself a quote. So <laughs> I, I always say 
to connect and engage with a patient or health community that will responsibly enhance, support, and educate you to be a better informed advocate for yourself or someone you love. So I would tell you to, to go out and find one if you want, to work on, on one if you want, but sometimes it's really good to find out where you're gonna get that information from. And um, thank you, this has been fun.